But first, just in, live breaking news right now on the WHAS 11 night team. As you can see right here, our crews are live on Preston Highway. That's right at East Indian Trail. This is just east of the Louisville Airport. You have a lot of police on the scene, and the road is now shut down there at Preston Highway and, and East Indian Trail. Metro Safe has confirmed to us that they are there with a serious crash, and a fire is involved in this crash. Police have had the road shut down now for more than 30 minutes. Now, we are working to determine exactly what happened to get you more details, but right now you are uh, asked to avoid the area of Preston Highway and East Indian Trail. We're also in contact with Louisville Metro Police for more information. But as you can see from our live picture, they're coming from the scene. Again, as we come on the air here at 11 o'clock, a, a large investigation that has been underway now for more than 30 minutes, still underway. We'll bring you another update right here on the night team. Now switching live right now here on the night team to downtown Louisville. It is still an uncomfortable, hot and stuffy night, even at 11 o'clock. And we have a heads up for you tonight. An air quality alert code orange kicks in in one hour at midnight for all of Metro Louisville. Louisville, and it's going to run to, to, until tomorrow right at midnight. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us on the night team. I'm Doug Prophet. I hope you were staying cool tonight as we are getting ready to get hit with the worst of the high heat days starting tomorrow. Meteorologist Christina San Juan is right here now, and it's uh, going to be good air, uh, not to be good outside at all to breathe the air or even be outside in that air tomorrow. Christina. No, I totally agree, Doug. Doesn't matter who you are, but I would not be spending an extended amount of time outside if you can help it. Now, if you absolutely do have to be outside for, say, the majority of the afternoon, I get it. You work outside. You got to go to work. Uh, I just highly recommend trying to stay hydrated, maybe with even more than just water, something with electrolytes, because we are going to really be kicking up the heat. In addition to having an air quality alert for the elevated levels of ozone pollution for your thermal. Thursday. Now, as we uh, take a look at the high temperatures, we are going to climb to 96 degrees on Thursday, and it gets even hotter Friday into Saturday. I'll tell you how high those temperatures go in just a bit. Doug. Thank you very much, Christina. Right now, all new on the night team. New developments surrounding the Silver Creek Dam in New Albany that we've been reporting about this week. Two city council members are now planning to introduce a resolution that calls for the dam to be removed. WHS 1119's Alex Dieterer and photojournalist Elijah McKenzie spoke with one of the council members leading the charge about why she's pushing for this removal and not just improvements. The future of a dam in New Albany that has existed for over a century has been discussed by the city of New Albany for years. I want a decision to be made so it's not drug on for another three years. Now, New Albany City Council members Stephanie Griffith and Scott Blair are introducing a resolution to the council to remove the dam entirely. And I hate to say it's about the money, but at this point, there's been a lot of money spent there, and we have a whole city we need to take care of, and I'm all for recreation, but there's some other issues that we could use that money for. Sidewalk, paving, fire trucks, safety for throughout the whole city. The resolution cites the danger of low head dams. The National Weather Service reported over 100 deaths nationally from 2018 to 2020 caused by these dams. This tragedy is felt right at home in Indiana, following the death of 14 year old AJ Edwards on Memorial Day. A memorial for 14 year old AJ now overlooking the dam where he lost his life. AJ's death now reinvigorating conversations about what should be done about the dam. On Monday, New Albany Mayor Jeff Gahan announced new new improvements to the infrastructure, which involves replacing the low head dam with rock pathways stretching the length of the water. We'd like to just kind of stop it. Let's go ahead and take care of it now. And my understanding is the dam has to come out before the rock arches come in anyway. So it's like, why are we waiting? While Griffith is worried too much money is being spent on the infrastructure, fishermen like Kevin Taylor flock to the dam and don't want to see it go. See a lot of people come out here fishing, like doing whatever, just joining the nature. It'd be scary on here, but you just got to know what you're doing. I don't think if you know what you're doing or know how to swim, I don't think you should be out here or up here for real. Mayor Gahan, who's against the removal of the dam, said the dam provides a habitat for wildlife, maintains the water supply, reduces flash flooding, and creates recreational opportunities like fishing. In New Albany, Alex Dieterer with photojournalist Elijah McKenzie, the WHAS 11 night team on your side. Again, so far, this is just a resolution and not an ordinance. It will be introduced to the New Albany City Council tomorrow at the Council's 7 p.m. meeting that's being held at City Hall. 
Right here new tonight, the Jefferson County coroner has identified the man who was shot and killed in Jefferson Town in a drive by shooting last night. You saw the story on the WHAS 1119 last night. 24 year old Derek Minot Jr. was shot at an apartment complex off old six mile lane. According to Jefferson Town Police Chief Rick Sanders, a car pulled up there and opened fire on a man and a woman. The chief says Minot was shot several times and died at the scene. The woman was taken to the hospital and is expected to survive. If you know anything that can help detectives, you're asked to call that number in J-Town. Again, the J-Town Police Department, 502-267-0503. A man from eastern Kentucky with a history of robbery convictions is now facing charges for two robberies right here in Louisville. Metro police detectives say that back on June 10th, Tommy Harden allegedly robbed the House of Jellish Nails on Bardstown Road and the Beer Nose Pizza Restaurant near Bowman Field. At both businesses, police say he threatened people with a gun and demanded money. Police say detectives found evidence from both robberies after conducting search warrants in Montgomery County and Bath County, Kentucky. Harden, who lives in Bath County, is now charged with robbery. He was previously convicted of committing 33 robberies in Louisville back in 2003. He served 20 years of a 40-year sentence and was paroled in 2022. A business crackdown in the Highlands neighborhood. Cafe 360 and Afrikaanza could have their alcohol license revoked if they cannot reach an agreement with the city of Louisville. The two bars have been under scrutiny for months after both late night bars were the scenes of deadly late night shootings. Both bars at the time agreed that they would suspend their late night liquor licenses. However, according to notices posted to both the businesses doors, they have been illegally selling alcohol after 2 a.m. Kind of live in fear, you know, over this. I feel like somebody needs to say something. Nobody wants to have a business that is the centerpiece of violence. Right? That said, we have rules and laws in this community for a reason, and we have to enforce them. Now, the businesses and the owners of each building will need to meet with codes and regulations and find a resolution to these issues. If they can't reach an agreement, the businesses may be forced to close or lose their right to sell alcohol permanently. The former MSD employee convicted in the crash that killed an LMPD detective in 2018 is asking a judge to vacate his conviction now. Roger Burdett was driving an MSD tanker truck when it crashed into Detective D.D. Mingadote's cruiser on Christmas Eve. She was stopped on I-64 near the Belvedere conducting a traffic stop. Police say Burdett had drugs in his system and was watching porn on his cell phone when the crash happened. He's asking a judge to throw out the conviction, saying he was denied effective assistance by his lawyers. Right now, he's serving a 27-year prison sentence. Well, a new multi-million dollar project is hoping to curb drug abuse in Floyd County, Indiana. A new drug interdiction task force will work to connect those charged with drug-related crimes with resources that can help them out. The project is being funded by settlement money gained from several lawsuits between the government and major pharmaceutical companies. The task force will consist of the county prosecutor in southern Indiana, a judge, and the sheriff's department. Judge Kerry Stiller says about 90% of cases they see in courtrooms are related to drug abuse. What we're trying to do is make sure that these individuals who are affected by drug abuse or substance abuse or mental health disorders and a lot of it's co-occurring, so it's both, and make sure that they have opportunities for treatment at each and every phase as they go through their case and then well beyond that. Two ordinances were passed in Floyd County to manage the funds, one to aid drug abusers, the other to fund law enforcement operations. A well-known and controversial JCPS school board member is dropping out of his race for re-election. Chris Kolb, who represents the Highlands, St. Matthews, and surrounding areas, tells WHAS 11 News that he made the decision after the teachers' union decided not to endorse anyone in the race. In a statement, he said, quote, There is literally nothing else I could have done to support teachers and the union. So, if that's just not enough... I'm just not the guy for this job anymore, end quote. He has six months left in his term on the school board. Of the four school district seats up for election this year, only one current board member, Gail Logan Strange, the former Brown and Williamson Tobacco Communications executive, is now running for re-election.
All news since 6 o'clock happening tonight. Juneteenth celebrations continued in Louisville. Events honoring Louisville community leaders for their service. WHS 1119's Taylor Woods and photojournalist Addie Hill went to two of the programs honoring everyone from executives to civil rights trailblazers. Fellowship and Unity at Louisville Central Community Center's 7th Annual Juneteenth Awards. Well, Juneteenth is really, really special, not only for our culture, but for my family. Corinza Townsend is the new Chief Administrative Officer of Norton West Louisville Hospital. She's one of six honorees recognized for their equity and inclusion in the community. There's a lot of people doing a lot of great things in our community, and just to be labeled as one of them is just super exciting. I'm almost overwhelmed. West Louisville's first hospital in more than 150 years is set to open in November. We're full of brick. We are putting out black top, we're painting inside, we're right around the corner. The Juneteenth Celebration Gala commemorates the significant date of June 19, 1865, when the last slaves were set free in Texas. Kevin Fields, president and CEO of Louisville Central Community Center, is proud to see it recognized as a national holiday. It means that, you know, there's some serious reflection on the atrocities of the past when it comes to slavery, Jim Crow, and all those other issues. Inside the Kentucky Center for African American Heritage, Elmer Lucille Allen, who turns 93 in August, was the first African American chemist to work at Brown Foreman Distillery. She was honored with a sculpture and gallery named after her. It's really an honor, you know, to be for this to happen to here. When they first opened here, I volunteered the first four years that they were open. Juneteenth is personal to Allen. She's a Louisville legend who has lived through segregation, the civil rights movement, and other historic moments. If you sit down and realize all the work that was done was done on the backs of African Americans. After so many years, she's amazed to see June 19, 1865 recently recognized as a federal holiday. Okay, wonder why did it take so long for it to be recognized? Taylor Woods, WHAS 1119 on your side. And the man who is behind the creation of Juneteenth is buried in Kentucky. This man, United States Major General Gordon Granger, is the union leader who read that order in Galveston, Texas, that all enslaved people were now free. It was read on June 19th that year, more than two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. But it took that long to get the word all across the United States. Granger is buried right here in the Lexington Cemetery, the equivalent to Louisville's Cave Hill Cemetery. After the war, the New York native married Marie Maria Letcher of Lexington, that's why he's buried right here in Kentucky.